John chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And that's where we'll stop today. There was a faith that was delivered, and that is the faith that we are told to maintain. And that faith is articulated in the Belgian Confession. And, of course, as I've mentioned before, the signers said they'd rather die than deny what it says. And they got more specific. And these were common punishments that were dealt out in these days. That they would rather offer their backs to stripes, their tongues to knives, their mouths to gags, and their whole bodies to the fire, rather than deny the truth affirmed in this confession. This is some pretty strong stuff. Would you be able to do all of that for your confession of Jesus? Lots of people in our time believe wrongly. There's quite a few people out there, and if you poll people, that they have wrong beliefs about God. And this is kind of alarming. Um, how about this statement? Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. All right? We just read that the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Everything was made through him. But look at how many people agree with this. Of all Americans, 53% agree. strongly, only 36% disagree, but evangelicals even, people who gave five, they agreed with five evangelical statements, 43% agreed with that. (coughs) Weekly attenders, people who attend church weekly, 42% agreed with that. That's alarming. Um, I I hope that that would not be you. Um, Jesus was much more than a great teacher. He was God, the Son of God. Okay, how about another one? Even the smallest sin deserves eternal tam- damnation. Um, we have a Bible verse that, that speaks to this. James 2, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So, yeah, if, if you've sinned, your sin might not be as bad as somebody else, but you've broken the whole law. Well, lots of people don't see it that way. Um, 69% of Americans disagree with this. Of evangelicals, 39% disagree with this. Weekly attenders, more than half, disagree with this. That's concerning. Um, our, our sin is quite serious, and we need to take it seriously. Um, how about one more? God chose the people he would save before he created the world. The Bible speaks to this. Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and 5. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Well, lots of people don't believe that. Um, 
Americans, 52% disagree. That's more than half. Evangelicals, 37% disagree. Weekly attenders, 44% disagree with this. Um, we, we need to know what we believe here. Um, we need to base our beliefs on what the Bible says and not just what we think it might say or whatever we feel is right. Um, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. That was what we talked about last week about sin. And we can't overstate the seriousness of sin. In fact, you could put it this way. God would have been perfectly just to send all of us to hell for eternity. He would have been perfectly right in doing that. He had every right to do that. The wages of sin is death, and all of us have sinned and fall short of his glory. So, coulda, woulda, shoulda, that would have been us. When a horrible crime is committed, it's not right for law enforcement and the courts to just look the other way. God is just, and so justice must be done. And people on our own, and as sinners, we don't want God. We'll only accept God on our terms, us as sinners. We won't accept him as he is. We won't follow his commands. People want to be their own God. That's sin, the nature of sin. So God is perfectly just and fair to give people what they want. But God is also merciful and mercifully chose to save. And we recognize both. God is merciful and he's just. One does not cancel out the other. He's both. And in his actions, Christ on the cross, that is God's mercy and his justice. So, well, here's one thing that I think about. There's a lot of people who ask, how could there be an all-powerful God when there's so much evil in the world? I think the bigger question is, and more amazing thought is, if there's so much evil in the world, why would God choose to save us? Why wouldn't he throw us away? When you and I have something that goes bad, we throw it away. We have something we can't use anymore, we throw it away. God didn't throw us away. He chose to be merciful. That's amazing. That is God's love. And it's an amazing love. <clears throat> Look at how the Belgian Confession puts it here. Article 16, we believe that all Adam's descendants having thus fallen into perdition and ruin by the sin of the first man, God had showed himself to be as he is, merciful and just. He is merciful in withdrawing and saving from this perdition those whom he in his eternal and unchangeable counsel has elected and chosen in Jesus Christ our Lord by his pure goodness without any consideration of their works and he is just in leaving the others in their ruin and fall into which they plunge themselves. He's merciful and he's just. The Bible gives us, and I've talked about this in the past, but I think it's worth repeating. The Bible gives us two perspectives on our salvation. All right? When you read the Bible, there's two perspectives on how we are saved. There's our responsibility and there's God's sovereignty. There's both. The Bible talks about both. And so we need to account for both in whatever worldview we, we adopt here. So we have a responsibility to believe, to repent, to obey, to persevere. And there's urgency with all of that. We have that responsibility. But there's also talk in the Bible about God's sovereign election by grace alone. There's both. So we need to acknowledge both. In the passage we read, there's both. Um, in verse 12, I'm just going to read that again. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Verse 12, that highlights our responsibility to believe. Everybody who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, that, that, that's open to anybody. Anybody who believes in his name, God gives the right to become children of God. So it highlights our responsibility. We need to believe in his name. And so there's other verses too. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. That's from Jesus. Anybody. 
Come, come one, come all, right? Or Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life. I'm giving you a choice to make. But then there's verse 13, which highlights God's sovereignty. Who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. There's, there's two angles on one salvation here. God, this highlights God's sovereignty in, in our election. None of us chose to be born. We don't, that's not something we choose. It's something that was chosen for us. You and I are here not because we decided to exist, but because God put us here. And so the same is true of salvation. As Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. It's important to have both of those perspectives on our salvation and not let one cancel out the other. All right. What I want to impress upon you today is this. Jesus Christ himself is our salvation. Salvation is a person. It's more a person than it is anything else. More than an event, more than a state. Salvation is a person. If you belong to this person, you have that salvation. You have eternal life. You need not fear death. You need not fear anything in this world. So our salvation rests on Jesus' identity and his work. What, who he is and what he's done. And if you mess with either of those, then our whole salvation falls apart. All right? But it's important to know that who Jesus is and what he has done. And get, getting those right, otherwise our salvation falls apart. The person of Christ and the work of Christ. The wrong ideas of Jesus bring not only false thoughts, but undue worry and anxiety about salvation. And looking back in my own life, um, there were times when I had the wrong ideas about God. And in those times, I was worried about my eternity. I was like really insecure about it. What if I'm not doing enough? What if I'm not enough? What if I didn't make all of the right choices? We need the right beliefs so that we will have the right peace. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The person and the work of Christ. Okay, verses 1 through 3. The beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, there was not anything made that was made. All right? The Word was creating everything with God and was also God. Okay? This goes back to Genesis chapter 1. John starts the same way as Genesis does, in the beginning. And he uses, he uses the same terminology. God spoke things into existence. And so John has said, in the beginning there was this word. And the word now becomes flesh. So John is trying to connect this to Genesis 1 and saying, Jesus was there. That was him. But then it says in verse 14 that this word becomes flesh. The word became flesh. Let's just think about that for a second. The word became flesh. That, that word flesh is a, is a kind of a striking one in the Bible. It really, what it does is it highlights all of the, uh, the, the raw aspects of human existence. All right? John could have wrote, he had a body, or he became human. That might have been a more sophisticated way to put it. But instead, he says the word became flesh. And he's trying to highlight those aspects of human existence that we might find embarrassing or, you know, stuff that we keep private about. Jesus became flesh. Now, I don't know about you, but it kind of strikes me as feeling disrespectful to think of Jesus having B.O. or having gas or diarrhea or stuff like that. But that's what this is highlighting. 
Jesus became, Jesus was flesh. And it's amazing that God would take all of those aspects of being human on himself. That's how amazing the incarnation is. That God would even assume that part, those parts of us. He had to be fully human to pay for human sin. Jesus was fully human. He wasn't mostly human. He wasn't kind of human. He was fully human. He was human in every way that you and I are, except, with, except for sin. And he had to be human to pay for human sin. Only a fully human could do that. There was an early Christian theologian named Gregory of Nazianzus. And the way he put it, I think, is very apt. Whatever Christ did not assume, he did not redeem. He had to assume every part of us so that he could redeem every part of us. All right? The Belgian Confession, Article 18, puts it this way. And he not only assumed human nature as far as the body is concerned, but also a real human soul in order that he might be a real human being. For since the soul has been lost as well as the body, he had to assume them both to save them both together. There was a time when I used to believe that, well, Jesus had a human body, but his soul was divine. But that doesn't work. Because if he didn't have a human soul, then the human soul is not redeemed. He had to assume it all to redeem it all. But Jesus being fully God and fully human, does that mean he had what we would call maybe a multiple personality disorder? Was he like one person one moment and another person the next? Jesus has these two natures, divine and human, but they are united in one person. All right? This was a big controversy for a while in the church. How do we understand this? If he's fully God and fully human, okay, well, how does that work together? I mean, doesn't the infinite part of being God just kind of completely overtake the human part so that we can't say he's human anymore? I mean, how does this work? Well, there was, this was a controversy, and, and it turns out it's not an irrelevant controversy because we can't say Jesus had multiple personalities. We can't just say he was human one moment and divine the next. He was both the whole time. Human nature and God's nature, they can't override one another or our salvation is compromised. He has to be both. And he has to be both together. And there's no evidence in Scripture that he had like two personalities inside of him or anything like that. He was one person. Here's something interesting. When Jesus was born, he was born of the Virgin Mary which we talk about in our creed and all that, everything. Okay? Think about this. Jesus had DNA from his mother, Mary, and DNA from God. That's what we confess. If when you say, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, this is what we're saying. He had DNA from his mother, Mary, and he had DNA from God. Beyond that, I, I, I can't, we, we can't really speak to that because they didn't know much about DNA back then. Um, but Jesus had a natural human descent. He was, he looked like his mom. All right? It's Mother's Day today. Jesus had a mother too. And just like you and I, we might look like our moms, Jesus would have looked like his mom. He had, he shared her DNA. Um, it had to be this way because certain scriptures talk about this. Um, Romans 1 verse 3, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. All right? He, he had David's line in him. And one more, Galatians 3.16. This talks about Abraham, but it still applies. The promises are made to Abraham and to his offspring. And it does not say to offsprings, me referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. So Jesus is the descendant of David and he's the descendant of Abraham in, in the human way. 
But he also has DNA from God. And this is what Mary asked when the angel Gabriel came to her and said, Hey, Mary, you're going to have a son. Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? They knew about the birds and the bees. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit provided the other side of Jesus' DNA. Okay, so when Jesus lived his life, he had to be perfect. He couldn't commit sins. Jesus had to be perfectly righteous to meet God's standard of holiness. If Jesus, when he lived on this earth, he wasn't fully holy, then he wouldn't be able to pay for our sins. He needed to have God's standard of holiness so that we could measure up. A sinner can't pay for another sinner. Only a truly righteous Jesus could meet the righteous requirements of divine holiness. If you look back in the Old Testament, it says that all of those Old Testament sacrifices have to be without blemish. This lamb, this goat that you bring has to be without blemish. That's a sign that the one to be sacrificed was perfect and righteous and holy in every way. Jesus had to be fully human to pay for human sin. Here's a couple of scriptures here. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was fully human. He faced all the temptations we do. We can talk to him about stuff we're going through. Uh, One more here. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We needed God's righteousness. On that last day, you and I, you can't stand before God as a sinner and get away. That's not how God's justice works. So we needed Jesus' righteousness in order for us to be able to stand on that last day. But Jesus also had to be fully God to bear the infinite weight of sin. You and I, we couldn't bear the full weight of sin. We can't do that. We're not capable of that. Only a fully divine Jesus could bear the full weight of sin. And that's why every belief system that compromises on Jesus' divinity also compromises their own salvation and where you have to meet God halfway. But I'm going to let the Belgian Confession uh, speak to this. For it is written that the chastisement of our peace was placed on the Son of God, and that we are healed by His wounds. He was led to death as a lamb. He was numbered among the sinners and condemned as a criminal by Pontius Pilate, though Pilate had declared that he was innocent. So he paid back what he had not stolen, and he suffered the just for the unjust in both his body and his soul in such a way that when he senses the horrible punishment required by our sins, his sweat became like big drops of blood falling to the ground. He cried, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And he endured all this for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus on the cross is God's justice, paying for sin, and God's love, saving us from sin. Jesus truly died. When he was on the cross, he didn't sort of die. He didn't just faint. He actually died. His heart stopped beating. If you had the right monitors on him, you would not be able to find any brain waves. He was gone. He was dead. He was dead in every way that you and I will die. And it should also be pointed out that crucifixion is a death sentence. All right? If you're a Roman soldier and you were charged with putting to death some guy, right? then you are going to make sure that this guy is dead. Because if this guy somehow survives the crucifixion and walks away, then it's your life. So there's a reason why 
when they came to Jesus, they didn't break his legs, but they saw that he was already dead, but they wanted to make sure he was dead. So they pierced him in the side to make sure he, this, okay, I'm going to make sure this guy's dead. And it said blood and water flowed, which indicates that he was out of blood. In Belgic Confession, Article 21, it puts it this way, Therefore, we rightly say with Paul that we know nothing but Jesus and Him crucified. We consider all things as dung for the excellence of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We find all comforts in His wounds, and we have no need to seek or invent any other means to reconcile ourselves with God than this one and only sacrifice once made, which renders believers perfect forever. This is how wonderful our Savior is. And Jesus didn't just die. He truly rose again. We celebrate this on Easter. The tomb was empty and the risen Lord was seen by many. It wasn't just a rumor that He had risen. No. People saw Him. Lots of people saw Him. In fact, it was, so many people saw him that people believed that he had risen from the dead. They didn't just think, oh, maybe I'm seeing some sort of ghost or vision or something like that. No, no, they saw him, they touched him. It's like, he's risen. Here's how 1 Corinthians 15 puts it. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That means to pass away. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. One more thing that's worth mentioning. Jesus still has his human body. He didn't shed his body when he rose again. No, he still has it. This is, and this is really cool. His human nature has not lost its properties, but continues to have those of a creature. It has a beginning of days. It is of a finite nature and retains all that belongs to a real body. And even though he, by his resurrection, gave it immortality, that nonetheless did not change the reality of his human nature. For our salvation and resurrection depend also on the reality of his body. He has an actual body. And this is cool because one day you and I will be able to touch him. We will be able to touch his hands. We will be able to put our fingers into those nail holes in his hands. We will be able to, like Thomas, put our hand into his side. There's one day we will see those hands that took the nails. One day we will get to wrap ourselves in the arms that were outstretched for us on the cross. We will get to hug him one day. And we will get to look into his eyes that are human eyes like ours. And we will get to see divine love looking back at us. Not the human love that's out there that's imperfect and fallible, but divine love looking back at us. Final thought for today. Never doubt your salvation. It rests on a perfect foundation. Jesus Christ is the perfect foundation. And as it says in our passage, from His fullness we have all received grace on grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Father, thank you for not sparing your son, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being human like us. Thank you for being fully human and fully God. Thank you, Lord, for living a righteous life that was perfect and holy in every way. Thank you for going to the cross and dying. Thank you for rising again and ascending so that we would have a perfect and complete salvation. Never let us doubt it, Lord. But Lord, give us the right beliefs to comfort us in our difficult times. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.